Grace City, welcome to church. My name is Molly, your host for today, and this is a big week for a number of reasons. First, this is the last time that you'll see me here on this screen as Molly Clark. The next time you see me, I'll have a new last name. That's right, I'm getting married this Saturday. We're super excited. But enough about me. It's a big week for you too, because this will be the last time that we will live stream our Sunday service in this format at 10 a.m. We are switching things up a bit as we enter into the fall season and we cannot wait to bring you along. More on that to come at the end of the service. So much to look forward to today and the good news keeps rolling because this morning we have the honor of coming together all over the valley to lift up the name of Jesus, declaring his truth over our homes and in our hearts and inviting his presence and power into our world. I invite you right now to worship with us through singing. And before we start, I'd love to pray for you. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning and that we get to come together in spirit to worship as a family here in Corvallis and in the Valley. Would you be with us, Jesus, as we go out into our day and we learn more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our fight is with weapons unseen. Your enemies crash to their knees as we rise up and worship. When trials unleash like a flood, the battle belongs to our God as we cry out and worship. You're right. 
Dear kids of Kid City, these past six months have been a time you will grow up to never forget. They've been strange. They've been hard. Sometimes they were even scary. You were told that you had to stay home. Everything was closed. Everything got canceled. School, sports, your birthday party, even holidays didn't happen the way you thought they would. But as your parents, we also saw good things happen. So we want to highlight and reflect on what God has been up to. Because during this time, God is still working in you and moving in the world around you. We saw you learn to cook and bake. Boy, oh boy, did you bake. You learned how to answer your own question, what can I do? And did so by painting, getting outside, and really learning to appreciate the world that God has made. When you needed a friend to play with, you looked over your shoulder and found a sibling. And while sometimes you didn't get along, you learned more about each other, pressed in because you had nowhere else to go, and now you're closer than ever. You found new and meaningful ways to connect with the people you love. You found ways to celebrate and have fun. You learned things, created things, and some of you even got a puppy or even better, a new brother or sister. We snuggled on the couch and watched movies together. We read books together, went on walks together, ate dinner together a lot, like almost every day. Though we were apart from the world, we were together more than ever. God has given us, your family, the precious gift of time, time we will never forget and we will always cherish. You're facing hard things and in doing so, God is making you strong and full of faith. You can stand up in the face of disappointment, take God's hand and walk forward even when you don't know what the future looks like. To the kids of Kid City, we, your parents, are so proud of you. Keep on going, but never forget all the ways God has showed up in this unique season. As we start this new school year, we want you to know that you aren't alone. We love you, God loves you, and together we will get through this better and stronger than ever. Kids, you got this. 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 You, you got this. Work, you got this. You, you got this. Work. What an awesome time to look back at a wild spring and summer. Parents, you handled it with so much grace, and watching your kids walk through these challenges head-on kept us going too. I know that the fall may seem daunting, but taking a moment to look back and remember how far the Lord has already brought us helps us to remember to keep moving forward one day at a time. We're privileged to walk through 2020 together with you and your kids. At this time, we're going to continue our worship by inviting you to give. We know that every good and perfect gift is from our Heavenly Father, and we long to be a community that gives as freely as God has given to us, including in the area of finances. Today, I'd love to invite you to trust God increasingly more with the gifts He's given to you already through giving financially. To give today, you can text the word GRACE to 82257. Now it's time to close out this amazing sermon series from the book of Philippians with one final week of encouragement. Pastor Seth, you can take it from here. Well, good morning, Grace City, or whenever you happen to be watching, and good evening to all of you who are here gathered on this Wednesday night as we are recording. My name is Seth. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace City. If you have not actually been to a Grace City service in person, and I'm assuming there's more than one of you out there, uh, welcome. Welcome to this virtual moment, but I've got really good news. Starting next week, you can actually, if you like, participate in a live Grace City moment. We announced this last weekend. We've been working feverishly to get ready for this moment, but on September 13th, as I'm sure you've heard via announcements and so forth, 
we are going to do two uh, live services here at our building. Now, before you think we're just going back full bore, we've had to say this again and again and again. We're taking this virus extremely seriously. We are limiting the number of people in this building. Everything is spread out. Masks and uh, uh, disinfecting your hands is required upon entry. There's no kids classes and everything's going to be designed to make sure that we both follow the rules and stay extremely safe. I am very confident that we can do this well. In fact, that has been the main defining factor of this decision of when we would try to do anything was when we could confidently both do it safely and effectively. And so we're going to give it, we're going to give it a try and see, see how it goes. But already many of you responded. So thank you to those that have gone online or applied and RSVP'd for that moment. That is part of the conditions just to monitor how many people we're going to have in the room. So if you'd like to be at one of our Sunday services uh, on the morning of the 13th, just uh, go ahead and text Grace to 82257 or go on our website and you'll be able to register and claim your spot here. Uh, but I can't wait, I can't wait to be in the room with all the rest of our, can you guys wait for that? Isn't it going to be great? It's going to be really great. And uh, yeah, this room, like we had a bunch of stuff in this room, but now stuff's been moved out of this room and uh, all the sound and AV stuff has been getting ready for it. Uh, super, super cool. Um, it's just, it's starting to feel like Grace City again, just a little bit in just little ways. And so I'm excited to, to be here with you guys to do that. Now, we're going to actually do our final sermon in the book of Philippians. Uh, this is going to be the last one in the whole series, and uh, I'm really thankful for it. I'm very thankful for the text of Philippians that has helped us to walk through this moment. I hope that for any of you that are able to journey along with us, that it's been helpful for you. And, uh, and I'm pretty seriously, elders and I, praying about what we're going to do next. It's not that I don't have ideas. Uh, it's how big and bold we want to go with our ideas at this point and really, really what the Lord has for us. So we'll let you guys know. It'll be a little bit of surprise uh, next week, whether you're watching uh, our uh, online, because we'll still have our live stream available on Sunday mornings. Should you choose to watch there, that would be awesome to have you online if you can't be here or don't feel comfortable being here in person. I hope that you guys know and feel that you are loved, you are cared for, and coming and gathering or just watching online is not a dividing line to see like how much we would care about you or think about you or pray for you or value you uh, or to think less of you for any of those reasons. So anyway, wh wherever you need to be to engage with us is where you need to be and we're excited for that to happen next week. Um, so all that being said, I'm going to pray briefly and then we're going to dive into this uh, final text here in Philippians chapter 4. So Father, would you please help us with this? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys, here is the text. We're going to go from Philippians 4 and starting in verse 10. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. Um, and I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, here is an iconic, iconic passage. In fact, many of you who are at all familiar with the Bible might actually recognize Philippians 4.13. Because, uh, okay, I realize I probably reference sports a little bit too much to represent the full demographics of Gray City. Because if you are not into the whole sportsy sort of thing, you like, that's fine with me. In fact, I appreciate that there are people like that because there are moments when it's just there's too many people that care too much about the sportsy thing. But for anyone that has any kind of a Christian sports background together, Philippians 4.13 seemed to be <laughs> the mantra. I think I had it uh, taped up onto my locker at uh, one different point of, of college. Uh, and it's just, it's a big verse for many. Because if you just kind of extract it out, I can do all things. Typically, the translation would say something. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. <clears throat> and you apply it to the weight room. If you're lifting something big, you apply it to the track. If you need to run faster than everyone else, you apply it to the court or the field or the classroom if you have a big test or some big challenge you have in life. And it's just one of the easiest verses to take and universally apply to whatever you feel like you either need inspiration for, encouragement for, or a sense of no matter what I'm going against, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do this. And like Jesus is going to help me. 
Jesus is going to help me do the thing. Whatever the thing is the thing that I'm trying to do, that I'm scared of doing, or it's going to be hard to do, it's just Jesus is going to help me do the thing. Now, here's the only, uh, here's the only issue with, uh, with that. Not that this verse isn't great, not that this promise isn't true, but that this promise, like all the promises of the Bible, have a context to them. They have a context. And this is one of those that just loves to get ripped out. Athletes don't care much about the context of the verse. They just want to set a personal best. They just want to excel and get to the next level of their career, just like many other people, and considering this verse, may. But there is a context that is important to consider. Now, I understand the deep urge to rip this specific verse out of its context because I love to believe that no matter what challenge I am presently in, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I just want to immediately apply it to that challenge because, of course, Jesus is going to help me get through it. Now, my most recent challenge that this happened, and I, like, I know the context of the verse, and here's why it's still a challenge for me. Uh, I did uh, one of the coolest weddings that I did this, uh, just this past weekend. All, there's several couples that have been engaged in Gray City. They've had to delay and postpone and come up with all kinds of different plans given the whole COVID situation. Uh, and it's been both kind of sad and also kind of invigorating because some people are just getting really creative, you know. Uh, but one of the couples that I was committed to doing their wedding had to move it several different times. It was supposed to be in a couple different locations across the country. And they finally uh, ended up deciding upon uh, getting married at the top of the South Sister. Now, for those who don't know the South Sister, it's the third highest peak in Oregon, the Cascade Range. So you like head over to Bend and, uh, and there they are, the three sisters, North, Middle and South. And South is the biggest of those three. Uh, it's a pretty big mountain. It's over 10,300 feet tall. Um, and it's unique in that it is, um, it's, it is over 10,000 feet tall and it is a volcano, like it is a mountain for sure, but it's the most accessible, one of the most accessible mountains of that height that you'll find anywhere. So there's no technical climbing. As long as you've got the willpower, the stamina, the fitness, whatever, just one foot in front of the other, you're going to get to the top. They decided to do their wedding at the top. They asked me if I would do the wedding at the top. But the deal is you start, you start like at the trailhead around 5,000 feet and you got to go all the way up to 10,000 feet and there's about six to six and a half miles in between those two points. It's long, it's really long, and it's not so much the length that gets you, it's the height, it's the height, because the last little bit, you are going near straight up, and it's all loose kind of volcanic rubble, and so it's like trying to walk up sand is what it feels like, so you don't always have a good grip, it's really steep, and uh, like there was like grandmas and grandpas that were walking right past me, right on up, and there was a couple little kids that were just flying right up, and uh, it was not easy, and it was warm, and it was hot. I got a little sunburned, and I was, uh, I was on this little hill, like looking what felt like straight up for another mile, uh, another mile to go nearly straight up, just three steps, catch my breath, three steps, catch your breath. Oh, did I mention you're at elevation, so that kind of takes away oxygen. Oh, that old, like, side issue thing that we don't ever think about very often. Oxygen is less up there. So you're doing like one of the hardest things physically you've ever done with less oxygen than you've ever done it with. And I remember thinking to myself, this verse, I can do all things through Christ. I can do this. I can do this. Jesus, you better help me do this because I can't, I cannot be the pastor that says, sorry, you can't get married. I'm going back home. Like I can't do that to them, right? So I wanted to take this verse and apply it. Uh, but I, I knew that, I knew that in the back of my head, that was not what this verse was about. Even though on some level, it does give you that little twinge of comfort and a little extra boost you need. And in case you're wondering, yes, we did make it to the top and here's what it looked like. Uh, so on the view there in the background, that's the middle and north sister. And you can see we are looking down on them. That's how high we are. And yes, that is a cliff. And yes, you can see me leaning away from the cliff because I have a thing with heights. But they were like, oh, it would look so cool, Pastor Seth, if you could just get right up to the cliff so we could get you right next. You know what would also be cool? Me not dying. That would also be great, too. I was, but anyway, beautiful couple, uh, Alex and Katie Gary now, uh, who worked uh, for the Oregon State Athletic Department. Super cool. Uh, have since taken a job out of state, but they came back to do the wedding. Doesn't that look amazing? That was, and we put like on suits, and she put on her wedding dress at the top of a mountain. It was all just a big thing, and it was beautiful. And we somehow survived, even though Philippians 4.13, I knew, wasn't the exact verse meant to be applied to mountaineering. But it is a verse that is applied to contentment. 
Now, contentment is a very elusive idea. You take a guy like John Rockefeller, who I think summarizes the idea of discontentment better than anyone. He was one of the richest people, if not the richest man in the world uh, back in his day. You put it in modern day dollars and he had well over 200 billion. He was a big time baller. And he was asked one time, how much does it take to make a man happy? Exactly how much do you need? And his response, just one dollar more. Just one dollar more. Here's the guy that had more than like, all, like all, all of us. And it wasn't about how much he had. It was about trying to constantly and incessantly have more. And this verse was specifically about Paul referencing his need. When you're in a Roman prison, the Roman system didn't supply uh, supplies, food, so forth, for their prisoners. So you were dependent upon your friends to come and bring that for you. This meant Paul knew what it was not only to be in prison, but to be in a severe shortage, to be very, very hungry. And when he's culminating this letter, essentially he's writing a thank you letter. Because they sent a guy named Epaphroditus to expedite a gift from the Philippian church to Paul in order to supply him all the needs that he would have while he was in prison. They're showing up at a great hour of his need to show their affection for him in a very, very tangible way. And Paul is writing to them in an interesting fashion because he didn't just come right out and say like, oh my gosh, you guys are heaven sent. You're wonderful. Look what you've done for me. Look at the amazing gift you've given to me. I can't thank you enough for this. He doesn't give a traditional thank you letter. He actually does it in a way that's like, is that really saying thank you? He says like, hey, I know what it is to have lack and be totally content. Because if I have a lot or if I have a little, I'm okay. Which isn't necessarily, thank you, you know what I mean? When someone has sacrificed greatly in order to supply your needs, when you say like, yeah, I didn't really ask for it and I didn't really need it. He goes on to like give like some gratitude for it and like, but he does it in a very careful way because what Paul is dealing with in prison has for him, nothing to do with how much or how little he has, but the ongoing journey he's been under learning about how to be content no matter how much or how little he actually does have. And so for him, he actually says these words, I have learned the secret. I've learned the secret of being content, no matter if I have a lot or if I have a little. I've learned the secret. Now, as elusive as contentment was to John Rockefeller, it's no less elusive, I think, for us. I don't think no matter what your measure is, all of us want more. You might want more security. You might want more money. You might want more beauty. You might want more stuff. You might want more friends. You might want just more time. You might just want more kids. You might want less kids. I don't know. Like, but we just all want more, more, more. And the question always becomes, well, how much is enough? How much is enough? How much is enough to when we can actually rest? When is it that we can actually just stop trying to chase endlessly after the things we think will make us happy when we actually just become happy and content exactly where we are? And what Paul said was, yeah, this wasn't innate for me. This wasn't like my personality. I'm not just like a beach bum that didn't really have a whole lot of aspirations. And so I'm just kind of more my disposition is towards contentment versus ambition. Paul said, I learned it. I had to learn it. Which is where the conversation about contentment actually has to begin. Not that some of us by nature are and some of us by nature are not. Not that some of us have like become Christian all of a sudden. It's just something that gets injected into you but it's actually something you need to actively learn, even as a Christian. And he writes that, okay, I learned it, but I learned the secret, he says. And that word he uses for secret is almost like an insider club rite of passage. It's almost as if it's this non-obvious thing that he has encountered, as if it's like almost this exclusive little club hidden off way in a dark alleyway, and someone taught him the secret code to get in. It's not this obvious Mount Rushmore sign that anyone can access if they're just willing to open their eyes. There's plenty of things that are 
wide open and available for us to learn if you will just simply pay attention. Paul said, no, I had to learn, and I had to learn the secret. I had to actually do the hard, nitty-gritty work of walking through life with Christ, learning how to be content. I didn't know what it was to be content in the beginning, and I'm still struggling in the middle, but I'm learning it and on the path towards it, as I've had to go through plenty of times of lack and extreme lack, and then I've had plenty of times, in his own words, with plenty. And I'm sure we will have to relativize what Paul means by plenty. Because I'm pretty sure all of us, no matter what the income stream looks like right now, has more than what Paul means by plenty. So how do we learn the secret? It almost feels like I'm teaching some sort of like, Cult, it's like sort of secret, like a little, right? How do we learn the secret? How do we learn the secret? <clears throat> the bottom line is, there's no way any of us will feel the contentment of Christ if we don't put in the effort. You've got to learn it. You've got to learn it. You've got to learn it. Otherwise, the cancerous corrosion of discontent will continue to consume us and you'll live your entire life as if You'll only be happy when. You'll only be satisfied if. And we'll just constantly chase it as if it's some carrot on a stick long out in the distance. And the most frightening part is that for some of us, we might actually get some of these goals. And then as it has become cliche to see in culture, we'll get them only to realize they're empty. We'll get the job. We'll get the spouse. We'll get the amount of money. We'll get the car that we pinned up on our wall when we were teenagers hoping someday we would drive. We'll get the thing. We'll get the thing. And then we'll realize, all right, whatever itch I had before, it's not scratch now. Paul said, yeah, I learned. So much so that he like, I'm not going to say he sounds like a jerk. He just kind of sounds like a jerk. <laughs> they gave you a generous gift. Send a man on a dangerous journey to deliver it. And he, his response to them is not, oh, you saviors of my soul, thank you. It's like, I appreciate the gift, but with it or without it, you're not my savior, Jesus is. So how? How did Paul learn this? How might we actually learn this? Could you imagine what it would be like to be content? To not always be worrying about the extra five pounds you're hoping to lose. To not always worry about what the next step on the career ladder is. To not be like incessantly thinking about who your future spouse is going to one day be or if you're ever going to meet them. Could you think about what it would be content in your marriage if you are married? Could you imagine thinking about not someday when your marriage will be awesome, but this day where you get to enjoy this beautiful gift that God has already provided? Could you imagine, could you imagine knowing that all things could just kind of pass away, like taken away, just like the tide? And fear would not grip you. Peace, faith, joy, hope would remain like a bedrock, unshakable, unmovable. Paul's learned how to get there somehow through Christ. And I think it's worth our time and energy to do likewise. Because the promises of this world, I really don't think pan out. But promises of Christ absolutely do. So how is it that we could actually learn the secret of being content? In Paul's language, he says, learn the secret that no matter what I go through with Christ, I'll be fine. It's not just I've learned to have a little and be okay with it. I've learned how to have little with Christ, and with Christ, it's always enough. And I've learned how to have much with Christ. And in Christ, when I have much, I'm never truly relying on the much. I rely on him. So here's a few ideas about how to get to this place of understanding what it means to be in Christ and rely on him. A couple of thoughts. Number one, this has gone throughout the letter, is remember to rejoice. Remember to rejoice. How do we actually learn the secret of being content? You remember to rejoice. It's so easy to think about what we don't have 
and to completely miss what we do. In fact, it's one of the big errors that so many uh, charities, uh, philanthropists, even churches make at times. There's a whole stream of nonprofit world that now calls, um, <clears throat> that looks at not needs-based ministry, but asset-based ministry. Meaning it's easy to walk into a community that's maybe underserved, underprivileged, or uh, impoverished in some way, whether it's here or abroad, and it's easy to pick out what you might see as all the needs in that community. But what studies have shown time and time again is the ineffectiveness of so many nonprofits to actually do, though well-intentioned, trying to help people. It's shown that many churches, many ministries, even many secular nonprofits have failed at their mission to actually long-term and sustainably help people because they have only assessed people based on their needs and not their assets. And when you actually go into communities and think about not what they don't have, but what they do, and then come alongside them to see how you can amplify that, that is usually what lifts people up out of the place that they're currently in. And remembering to rejoice follows this. It's an asset-based way of looking at your life and your spiritual journey with Jesus. Not what do I still lack, but what is it that God has already done? What is it that I already possess? What is it that I have now that's never going away? And when you train your mind to remember all of the ways in which God has met you, has worked on your behalf, has met you in the past, you remember to rejoice so that when you go through your imprisoned moments where you've run out of food like Paul, so to speak, you don't freak out, you don't panic, you don't become anxious. All it does is trigger for you all the other times God has come through in the past. Way easier to say than actually do. It's almost embarrassing when I'm at home sometimes, freaking out over large bills that come, because my kids are now old enough to call me on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? My wife used to call me on it, uh, but now my kids are old enough too. And the other day, just the other day, one of my sons was like, Dad, I know you're freaking out about this, but it seemed like you were freaking out about something else a couple months ago, and God came through on that, didn't he? Well, that's, that's not the point. <laughs> Stop it. You're not allowed to use my material against me. Like, that's not how this works, right? I'm not giving you ammunition just to throw the Jesus darts back at me, you know? But he did, and he, and he won. He won. It's true. I know, I know, because I haven't fully learned the secret, if I'm being honest with you. I'm on the journey of trying to learn it as well. But I know I need to remember to rejoice because rejoicing might look like the most foolish thing to do when we feel isolated or alone, when we feel in lack or in need, but rejoicing is what just ignites the reality of our future hope that we have in Christ, our present faith that we have alive in Christ, and tells us, you know what, in Christ, in Christ, I'm okay. I'm okay. The worst thing that can happen to me in this world is the best thing that can happen to me in this world. Paul literally got to the place, well, if they kill me, I gotta be with Jesus. And if they let me stay alive, I'll just keep spreading the news about Jesus. Win-win. I don't know if we'll ever, any of us in this room or watching online, if we'll ever get to quite that level of an extreme, but that's at the bottom. That's at the bedrock. That's at the place where you'll find and learn the secret to being content. They can take my life, but they can never actually take my life. I could lose everything, which will never actually take away anything. And once you've learned, you win. You win. Never again will you have to hold onto a white knuckle grip to the control of your life, your circumstances, and your possessions. But you'll be able to live with joy as like the times and seasons wash over you, the highs and lows, the ups and the downs. Just follow the Christian logic. Think. Don't think less. Think more. Think. Think. What is the end road? What is the greatest thing that could ever be to, like our lives? And what's at the end of our life? Being with Jesus and a greater life to come. And once you get there, that you realize there's as tragic, as painful, as disappointing as many things. No, no, no. I'm not denying any of that. 
But we rejoice in that, yeah, there's, there's nothing that can be taken away from me that can actually be taken away from me. <clears throat> and the best is yet to come. So we remember to rejoice, and we do it often. Second, and Paul seemed to do this incredibly well, <clears throat> you appreciate every season that you're in. Because sometimes it's not just about, like, do I have a lot of food in the cabinet or not, right? Sometimes it's just about a season of life that we're in. I think for my wife and I, back to the time where we had uh, young kids, and we had at one point three young boys, like a, a baby and a toddler, and like a preschool, like bam, bam, bam. And I know some of you guys have had like twins, or like, you know, or uh, like, like really compact spaces where you have children. I don't know why we do this to ourselves. Have so many kids in such short amount of times. It sounds fun on paper. You know what I mean? And then you just realize very, very quickly how it is just a season of time. I just look back now at that season of my mid, late 20s, early 30s. I just remember being tired, <laughs> like all the time, tired. It was just a season of lack. It was a season of less. And there wasn't a lot of money to go around. And you're just hoping to keep diapers supplied and keep food on. It was just, it wasn't extravagant vacations. Like, oh, we're driving to Newport this year for the big vacay, you know, what I mean? that's, that's, that was it, that was, and that was great, and the kids play in the sand, they eat a little bit of it, and then we go home, like, that was it, that was the big moment, the days were long, but the years were short, and you realize in hindsight, what you hope to appreciate in the moment someday, that it was a season, it was a season, and my physical exhaustion is not now what it once was when my kids were little, but now there's all kinds of different challenges as my kids grow. Now there's all kinds of different challenges, both in my marriage that's now been going for 18 years versus just eight years. And I learned that there's just different seasons. It's easy to think of a season of singlehood, uh, to think of not being married, and to despise this moment, and to try to imagine a way to be content in your life when you're just desperately thinking about or desiring for marriage someday. But I've noticed a pattern that I just, I'm, I'm hoping to find the outlier that can contradict this, but I haven't yet. That those that put so much hope and expectation and somehow marriage being the thing that completes them and makes them happier than they would otherwise be, it, I have yet to seen it. In fact, those that put the most amount of expectation in marriage usually have the worst experiences in marriage. Because marriage is, is not going to just make your life better. It's actually going to make it a lot more challenging. And the point of singlehood, the season of it, is learning how to find the sufficiency of God's presence in your life. One of the favorite sayings that I have about singlehood and marriage, whether they are just seasons or indefinite periods of our life, is that our singlehood is actually what demonstrates the sufficiency of the gospel. Meaning it's not marriage that completes me or takes me to the next step of the human journey. But actually being single or unmarried is itself a valid and beautiful way to live out the human story. And it's the gospel of Jesus that actually shows me I'm covenantally loved by him and included in his global family. And me getting married to someone else is not required to experience a new depth of love. And when I realize that the season that I'm in, it actually has a unique opportunity to teach me about the sufficiency of the gospel, I'm not always looking forward to the next season as if it's going to be the answer to my current one. And then when I'm in marriage, singlehood might show the sufficiency of the gospel, but marriage is what shows the shape of the gospel. And it helps me to understand the love of Christ from a different level. As I sacrificially love my wife, as she sacrificially trusts me, there's a pattern of our relationship that's meant to mimic and pattern itself after the way Jesus loves his church. And that's beautiful all in its own way. Not superior to, but both unique experiences of how to encounter God's love and good news. And when you learn to appreciate where you're at, not just look back to the good old days, oh, I remember when I had free time. I remember when I could kind of go to wherever I wanted to go. I remember when I didn't have to go to a kid-friendly restaurant. Oh, I, like, I remember all these. No, every moment and season that I'm in, it might have more or less of the resources or the time or the energy supplies that I might desire. But they're just seasons. 
And all of them have the opportunity to draw me further into the faithfulness and love of Jesus. They all do. I don't need to get out of the season I'm in to encounter the contentment and peace of God. I can find it here. And if I don't find it here, it's dangerous to assume I'm going to find it there. I need to find it in my present, not in the hope that one day the perfect girl will come along, the perfect guy will come along, one day we'll have the perfect kids, totally obedient. You know, like, my hope is in Jesus, and that through him and in him, union with him, I'm going to do all things. If I'm feeling lonely, if I'm feeling overwhelmed, if I feel like I'm losing myself, or if I have no one, I know that in him, I have everything I need to be content. All the raw power of God unleashed on my side to do well in any season that I'm in. And finally, and this is where Paul's going in the final part of this verse that we're going to talk about, the secret of learning to be content is about trusting his supply. And this is where he's going to use this moment of their gift to actually just preach right back at them. And here's what he has to say. He says, not that I desire your gifts, but what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I don't want more for me. I actually want more for you. And you giving to me is actually somehow giving more to you. We'll follow this logic for a sec. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. It's like, goodness gracious, Paul, just say thanks for crying out loud. <laughs> just say thank you. It's like, no, 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 no. I like, yes, I'm amply supplied now, but you thought you were given to me. This is actually a gift that you've given to Jesus. You've given it to Jesus, like to me, on behalf of Jesus, however you want to look at it. But here's what he says. I wasn't actually looking for more because I've learned the secret of being content with having less or virtually nothing. I've learned the secret of being that. I'm actually content with dying here in the cell. He's actually arrived at that place of peace. But I'm looking for what can be credited to your account. Because you know what Paul believed? Jesus. He thought about Jesus a lot. His Sermon on the Mount. His teachings a lot. And Jesus said to store up your treasure in heaven. Paul knew that the true investments we make into the things that are eternal, that last and remain, are not what we store up here, not what we accumulate here. And what we give away, the generosity that we actually pour out into the kingdom, well, that's the stuff that's actually accumulating in our account. And so Paul had a very different definition of rich and poor. For Paul, you could be really rich and yet super poor. Because you don't know what it is to actually store up for something. And he knows that when they are giving to him what's actually going on on a bigger level and he wants them to know, they're actually storing up an account for themselves. That Jesus himself is going to honor their giving and it's somehow going to be amplified. They're going to get interest on it. Like all of it is going to be stored in the life to come. Now, this is what we call in the biz crazy talk. Crazy talk, where we actually believe that my investments not only pull a much greater return, but are far more secure in the kingdom than they are in my 401k. And this is where some of you are going to listen to me. Some of you are going to get really uncomfortable here for these next few minutes. And uh, I've prayed through this the last few days, and I've decided I don't, I, I don't care. In fact, I'm going to lean into it a little bit and just see how uncomfortable I can make you. Because at some point, you got to decide what crazy actually is. And here's the deal. It's not going to be left up to chance. It's not going to be left up to just like a interpretation, personal interpretation of what you think is crazy or I think is crazy. Or I think radical generosity because it's actually storing up for something greater in eternity or just accumulating everything for myself here and now. It's not like, well, agree to disagree. I guess we'll just go our own separate ways. No, one day shortly, we will all die and we'll figure out what's crazy and what's not. We'll figure it out real quick. We'll figure it out real quick. You came into this world with nothing, and that's exactly how you're going out of it, but there is an opportunity you have in it to store up something beyond it. Beyond it. And this, this is the invitation that Jesus invites us into so that we can live with contentment here, not accumulation here, but contentment here. 
Now, one of the great tragedies of the American church specifically, I don't think any of us are untouched by this, myself included, is that we have loved to create a more middle-class Jesus. Someone that understands the financial complexities of modern markets and would surely desire to maximize all of our financial portfolios. And while I don't believe that Jesus has any problems with any of us being rich, and he certainly favored and blessed a lot of the people in the Bible to be incredibly wealthy, wealth isn't just about accumulation for our own security and well-being. It's about the opportunity to be a blessing in greater and greater ways. And it's only that which we give that accumulates into anything that's not going to one day just disappear. I remember, um, I remember I was a relatively early Christian, and I was starting to have some of my first conversations with like my old friend group um, from high school and like college and so forth. People now that I was a Christian were like, they were fascinated by Christian Seth. Christian Seth was a little bit different than non-Christian Seth. And I remember one time one of my friends was kind of poking, you know, at me a little bit and just trying to like, so let me get this straight kind of questions, you know what I mean? So let me see if I understand. You actually believe, you know what I mean, that your sins were paid for by Jesus. I'm, yep, yep, I actually do. It's amazing. You should, you should give them to him, you know? And one of the questions he threw at me, like, so let me get this straight. You actually give 10% of your money to God. You actually give away 10% of your money. And I said, no. I said, good. Good, at least you didn't drink all the Kool-Aid. You know, he was like relieved. Oh, finally, he's a little bit more. I said, no, I've, I've gone above 10 a while ago. 10 was fun. I figured 11 would be a blast. He said, dog, you, you're killing me. He said, are you, are you thinking about your future? I, I, actually, I am. Are you, do you realize what you could do with that money? Do you realize that you can make real money and how much 10% of that is? And I said, oh, I have no intention of giving 10. It's just way too fun to stop there. And my wife and I, like every year, we try to inch higher and higher. And so far, we've been able to. I'm really hoping to get to 20 someday. I'm on my way to 25 and see if we just can't keep going. And he said, dog, it's just crazy. And I'll tell you what, someday, someday, this life's going to be over, and we'll figure out who the crazy one was. Now, I know people who are way more generous than me. And I got that reaction from one of my old friends, but I'm not even nearly as generous as some serious generous people I know. And the reactions I see them get all the time are similar. I have friends who give away possessions and money and time and energy, even space in their houses radically. And I find it shocking how much they're criticized for it, how unreasonable it is and unsafe it is and unwise it is. And look, this is not the sermon where I give you your financial stewardship and planning and there's balance and wisdom that can be brought to that whole conversation. But if we don't start from the point where Jesus is actually Lord of all and his teachings in the Sermon on the Mount actually matter and that they're actually true and that there is a crazy way to live and it's holding on to everything that you have trusting in what you can supply for yourself. That's the crazy way to live. That's the insane way to live. But yet the most rational and beautiful way to live is according to how Jesus has called us to live. And that is trusting in his supply and giving. Because I know even as I give for the benefit of the people that I love and care about, I know that Jesus loves and care about. I know that all that is given is never gonna be wasted but is some, somehow and in some way the love and the fruit of the Spirit poured out in that moment is somehow accumulating to help establish the kingdom of God to come. You can call it crazy if you want. I've, uh, over the years, you get a lot of prayer requests as a pastor and we get prayer requests as a people. And one of the common prayer requests, prayer requests you get is about money. In fact, it's one of the most common things that couples will argue about, fight about, one of the most stressful things that any of us deal with in our life. It's finances, and oftentimes you'll get prayer requests for people that run out of money or don't have a job, and so money starts going down. And I love to pray for that. I love to stand with people because that's really stressful. It's difficult. It's hard. Learning the secret of being content in all circumstances and not 
it's a secret. It's not obvious. So it's, it's not an easy thing to learn. But I love praying for people with that. But I remember one time, there was actually a couple in our church that came with me with a very strange prayer request. In fact, there's, I can think of only two. Two times this has ever happened uh, in uh, like 17 years of ministry. <clears throat> they came to me and said, we just got a windfall of money we were not expecting. In one case, it was an inheritance. In the other case, it was a huge bonus at work and just like a, like a lot, a lot of money. Not like a college student saying they got a lot of money because they found like $20 on the sidewalk outside the Safeway money. Like upwards of high, six figures and high six figures money. Like big money. And uh, they said, uh, they came to me and said, Pastor Seth, we got a problem. I said, oh, geez, what's going on? So we just got a lot of money. I said, oh, can I have your problems? You know what I mean? <laughs> what a problem. Good for you. And they said, no, we're serious. Would you please pray for us? Pray for us to know what we're supposed to do with this money. And I find it interesting that most of us will either ask for or pray directly for times when we have little, but not when we have much. When if you were to actually read the Bible, there's way more warnings given about when we have much than when we have little. And not just saying, well, I have a lot. Great, I'll take it easy. I'll store up a little. I'll have safety nets. I'll just, all those things I've been wanting, I'll finally get. And just putting everything on autopilot, they stepped back and said, no. I believe it's because they had learned a little bit more of the secret of contentment than I had. They said, no, no, no. This is a much moment, not a little moment. This is a much moment. But I don't want to be content in what we have. I want to be content in Jesus. And if he says, give it all, it's all his anyway. I want to give it all. If he says, save it or invest it or give some of it or how much of it or in this direction, I just want to be obedient to it because my contentment is in him. And I don't want my contentment to change because I start trusting in anything but him. I don't know that many of us quite learn the secret to that level. Because sometimes having much is a far greater test than having little. Now, it's a test that many of us would be happy to sign up for, I get. Um, but it is a test nonetheless. And it is part of what it means to learn a secret of being content in any and all circumstances. That I can do all things through Christ. It doesn't matter how much or how little I have. It's him. It's him I have. I got him. And through him, I'm content. And my God, says Paul, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. That's what he's going to do. You thought, you thought you were giving to me, but I'm telling you this. God loves generosity so much that he wants to return to you the sense of generosity right back in your direction so that you understand the flow of his kingdom that is about freely giving and freely receiving. And there's something beautiful about that. There's something just beautiful about receiving and giving love back to Jesus. And this isn't, some of you are just only equating this to financial. This is something about so much bigger and broader and more beautiful than just financial. This is about living in a way so content that there's nothing you wouldn't give. Hand away. There's nothing, there's nothing that you could have in your possession that would give you any more amount of peace than simply the presence of Jesus that he promised would never leave you anyway. And when you get there, I think you win. It's a beautiful prize at the end of this, and his name is Jesus. And you don't put your hope in the things of this world. So my call to you, Grace City, is that you would take the word of God seriously and the words of Jesus very seriously. That you would weigh and consider the contentment of your old soul. Because let me, let, me let me just spoil the news for everyone in the room. I don't think we've learned the secret all that well. Some of us may be a little bit more than others, but we're all on this journey of learning, myself included, maybe most of all. That I can do all this through Christ in him 
He'll give me strength. He'll supply me. He'll get me through. And even if he doesn't get me through this, do you realize what's waiting for me? Do you realize how I'm eternally supplied and cared for and provided for? Do you realize how anchored and secure that actually is? I don't care how crazy I look now. It's going to look really smart later. It's going to look like the most sane possible thing I could have ever done was put all my hope in Jesus. Grace City, may we. May we not fall into this very comfortable middle-class Jesus that is just constructed around all of our own cultural preferences that have been all the ways that we've been told that what we need and how much we need of it and what we need to be doing and what we need to have in our life in order to feel the peace and contentment that many of us long for. May we rather trust that in Christ there is something far greater than anything this world can actually provide. And may we open up our white-knuckled fists to realize there's nothing I give away to King Jesus that is ever really lost. Having him. Don't you just want to give everything away to him and learn how to just put everything at his feet in a total radical trust? Because it seems like that is directly proportional to the peace and happiness that people find in here. And it has nothing to do with how rich I am or not rich I am. It is like that's so not the point here. Paul says both, right? I've learned it with a lot or a little. It's will you radically trust Jesus and actually allow him, allow him to be your supply? Will you allow him to be the thing you put your hope into? Will you allow him to be the thing that all your ambitions and desires which you have, which can actually be of God and from God, will you actually allow them to be reigned in and ruled by God? I think this is the beautiful and compelling Christian life. Not the safe, not the American flag wrapped around the Bible, cultural expression that some of us have found a little bit more comforting and temperate and mild-mannered, but letting Jesus be the great grand master Lord of our lives and the universe who knows every hair on our head and no matter, no matter what comes our way, we're on the journey with him knowing that I can do all this. I can do all this with a lot or a little. I can do all this with a lot or a little for him because the strength he has for me is greater than the strength I have for myself for all the resources I could can compile for myself. And with that, Grace City, let's pray. Father, this incredible letter filled with joy, filled with wisdom, I'm asking that our hearts would be open and receive it. I'm asking that seeds of your word would be planted deeply in our hearts. And I pray that we would walk away from this text one step further in the journey of learning the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. Father, I'm asking for my brothers and sisters with a lot, and I'm asking they would find their contentment in you. I'm asking for all my brothers and sisters with a little who are just struggling to get by. And Father, I'm praying they would find their contentment in you. Father, I'm praying that you would take our joy and you would separate it from every earthly resource and circumstance happening in our life. Help us, teach us, Teach us how to be content in every circumstance. God, we want to learn. We want to learn and we want to grow that in you we have far more than anything else we could ever have in this world. And Father, we want to live a little bit crazy for you. We don't just want to play it safe. We want to trust your words and live with the radical love that you did for us. God, and with all this we pray, we trust in your Holy Spirit to do this work among us and help us with this. Teach us all this. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Philippians, we made it. And we will see you all, uh, hopefully, next Sunday, whether it's online or here at our building. Don't forget to RSVP. Grace and peace to you all. Thanks, Pastor Seth. This was an amazing and encouraging sermon series. Grace City, let's be a church that longs to learn the secret of being content in every circumstance. 
Before we close, I have one update about in-person church starting next Sunday. You may have heard that we are going to be offering two in-person services starting next week at 9.15 and 11. These will be small, socially distant services, meeting and exceeding the requirements outlined by our governing officials to help keep each other and our community safe. So far, it looks like we can still meet together, so that's the plan, and it's super exciting. Here's the thing. Since we are still requiring pre-registration, which opened last Sunday, both of our services are full for the first week. If you registered, you will be getting an email this week with all of the final details. For those of you who would like to join us for a service in person in the future, we have opened up registration for the rest of September, and you can read more about what this will look like and claim your spot by texting GRACE to 82257. We realize that many of you who want to attend won't be able to or feel comfortable doing that yet. So we will still be offering an online service that will be streamed right here in the building at 11 a.m. each week. You can join us online at the same time that you have been, just an hour later than usual. Okay, that's a big change, and all of that info is available by texting GRACE to 82257 if you need a refresher. With that, we are going to close this service out with a prayer of faith together. You can follow along with me by reading the words right here on the screen. Father, we thank you for the truth of your strength in our lives. Help us to grow in contentment. We confess the secret that whether we have little or much, we know that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. We will see you next week on site at one of our in-person services or online at 11 a.m. for the new live stream. Have a great Sunday, Grace City. Grace and peace.